So our culture is absolutely insane. We're all absolutely barking mad. And the reason is because we're trying to follow Kronos. We're trying to impose Kronos on nature, on Kairos. They can't be more insane projects than a project like that. So let me give you an example. Is all over the Western world, all over the globe in fact, people will get on cars and trains and in planes, they will commute miles and miles away from their home to go into work in the dark, in the rain, in the snow. They don't want to be there. But million people, millions of people against their will will go ahead and do this insane exercise in the morning and they'll repeat it again in the evening. Why are they doing this psychotic behavior? Why do these people commute back and forth, back and forth, like a demented lion in a cage at a, at a zoo, an animal that's gone psychotic from being caged up? Why is it doing that? And then if you can't manage to get out of bed and do this insanity, then you go to a doctor to help you out. And he says, oh, yes, you can't get up in the middle of winter and fight the snow to get into the crowds and catch diseases and commute into this workplace where you don't want to be, then there's something wrong with you. Well, of course, there isn't anything wrong with you. It's normal behavior. You should stay in bed in those circumstances. But the doctor says, oh, that's seasonal affective disorder. You have a disorder. That means you are not ordered enough. So he gives you a pill so that you can make you more regular. When you're more regular, you're more easy to exploit. And that's why slave uh, owners always want their slaves to be predictable, to be truthful, to be honest, uh, and to do their duty as it makes them either easier to exploit. If your cows give milk regularly, then you can exploit that and be more efficient. If uh, they haphazard, it's very hard to make a living out of them. And so that's part of the reason why we worship Kronos today. Kronos is, equates to slavery. And if you deviate from chronological behavior, very, very unnatural thing. We're living organisms. So we're, we're not machines. But people like Bezos, they try and make their people that work for them are unfortunate enough uh, to get into the cult and, and take a job off them. Uh, they, they try to make them robotic so that they're predictable, they're controllable, and then a big alien cortex like Jeff Bezos can, uh, can exploit them, manage them, make billions out of them. And of course, uh, what he's doing is he's stealing time. He's stealing their time, and he's taking the money. Time is money. So all the exploitation, if you see exploitation, if you see slavery, the first thing you should look for is a clock. And then the same thing with debt is there's always a time component. You have interest, a regular schedule, that you must uh, pay up the interest on time. You mustn't be in default on your mortgage, um, because why a mort, mort, uh, mortgage is, uh, must be paid, otherwise you die. And if you get a bond, well, you bound. You, your future self is bound. So you, you sign a document today saying, I will bind my future self based on a clock, a schedule. And that's how every financial instrument works in effect. Uh, most commercial contract law is bound by this clock. So we're bound, we bind our future selves, our current self binds our future self uh, by signing on the dotted line uh, them into bondage. And yeah, that's, uh, that's the essence of debt and that's why we are debt slaves and wage slaves. Um, and that's why we, uh, we have the economic and capitalist system. The capitalist system is not a capitalist system. It's, that's a misnomer. That's a euphemism to cover up what it really is. It's a debt system. And it's, uh, you know, investors don't actually invest money. They extend credit. They extend debt. They allow you to get into debt. But they make sure that, you know, shares are are handed over that promise them that they will reap the cream of the crop. They will take Kairos, although they pay for Kronos. And that been, has been the game all throughout our capitalist system. Marx pointed it out that 
the, the trick with capitalism, capitalism is built on a fraud. It's built on a lie. And what that lie is, is to get workers and pay for their time, to pay for chronos, because that's predictable and uh, it's quantifiable and it's regular. So you pay people for their time and then steal their work product because they know full well, the capitalists, or rather the debtists, they know full well that your work product is worth far more to them than your time is worth to you. So by paying you for your time, but then crooking you and taking your work product as uh, their takeaway, is how capitalism has crooked uh, the working people for since, since it's virtually its an inception. And, and Marx understood that and, and mentioned it and called that wage slavery. Uh, so what, uh, what they've done is they've taken away other means of keeping alive. So they've taken away all the other opportunities you have to be a hunter-gatherer and then made sure that they pay you by the clock. But they keep the more valuable thing, which is your work product. If they paid you piecemeal or gave you a percentage, it would be fair, but then they couldn't get rich. So you can only get rich by being a banker or a rentier. You know, you have to pay the rent on time. And they're using time to exploit you, so you, you carry the risk. So the oldest trick, especially in the software industry, is to get people to commit to a deadline. So I, you know, there's this little tussle where uh, as a project manager or as a worker, they try and expand more and more who, who actually commits to the deadline. So whether the, de the deadline is not in your control, but what the management and the corporation is doing is pushing the risk onto you. So they're saying the risk of Kairos, that th you know, the weather might change, things might not pan out like you think, the, you know, Murphy's Law might come into it, all that's Kairos. So by putting a deadline on it and getting you as a worker, particularly office workers, they, they make a speciality out of this now. And then they say, you carried the can for the fact that uh, Kairos comes into Kronos. So you specify a deadline with Kronos, and then they know full well, you know and they know that shit happens. Kairos comes into it. But you carry that risk as the worker. That's They're trying to foist that on you. And then that means they can make profit more efficiently. If you don't make the deadline, then they can fire you. They can make you work harder to, to reach it. All of these ways are basically making you carry the cost of Kairos so that they can milk you on a regular basis according to Kronos. And that's what our whole capitalist system is based on, and that's why it's evil. It's a fraud. So if they were fair, and the company said, we will take the risk, so we know shit happens, so therefore there's no deadline on the project. That would be better for everybody, but it's unacceptable in our culture because our culture is capitalist and the capitalist wants a return according to Kronos uh, so that it's predictable. If it's predictable, uh, you can become a rentier, you can become a parasite. So just like I mentioned the viruses right in the beginning, they, the viruses, they're trying to be parasitic on the organism, us. So the rentiers, the financiers, they're all doing parasitic behavior. And just like parasites, they want you to be regular and predict predictable. So the virus doesn't want you to basically present random cards or play Rochambeau and do rock, paper, scissors and come out with things that it can't pre predict because otherwise it can't control you. And if it can't control you, it can't exploit you, you're free. So the secret to, to freedom is Kairos. And the secret to incarceration, slavery, coercion, totalitarianism is the clock. It's making you stick to that clock. Why? So that you're predictable. If you're predictable, you can be exploited. So now this leads inexorably towards the single demand that I think XR and Everybody that's fighting for social justice, climate change, renewable energy, a, a way to get back to Kairos is to have this one single simple demand. You say that in all contracts, commercial, private, any legal contract that has a reference to Kronos in it automatically invalidates that contract. So let me say that again. 
means that no contract can have a time component in it. It can't have a calendar time, it can't have a calendar schedule. Okay, now, it means that you can't put a date, uh, you can't put a period in there. You can't say, this has to be done weekly. You can't say, do an employment contract to say, I pay you by the hour. I pay you weekly, monthly. You can't, if you, if you insert that in a contract, what this demand would say would that contract would be unenforceable in law. It would be automatically nullified because it has a reference to chronological time. That's it. You simply ban time from contracts. Now, what does that do? It forces people to, into Kairos, uh, into a much slower system, so a much more inefficient system. Now, why would you want to do that? An economist would say that this is crazy. It's all about better, faster, cheaper. Well, we've got to this predicament by trying to squeeze out efficiency. So it's the better, faster, cheaper thing has made our lives shitty. It's pushed us into all these, uh, what David Graeber calls bullshit jobs. We've had this burgeoning service industry. Over 50% of people think our jobs are not worthwhile. The jobs that they do are not fulfilling. They're not worthwhile. They're not good for humanity. They're absolutely right. The only reason why we have them is because we're stuck in this paradigm that Marx was talking about, that we have to pay for people's time. Why? So they can steal the work product. So if you prevent people putting time in a contract, you force them into only signing agreements that are non-binding. Non so think of it as moving away from fast food to what the French would call slow food. It's a richer life. It's a better life. What we've got to, by trying to put a chicken in every pot, is basically a chlorinated chicken. We have non-chicken chicken. And that's what we've got by following what the economists were trying to do and saying that we need resources. The problem with the whole world is what the economist told us was they're not enough resources. So if you want to put a chicken in every pot, you want to raise the standard of living, you do that, magic happens. You raise everybody's standard of living over $5,000 and suddenly they start caring about the climate. So that's the clue to climate change. You look at overpopulation. Well, you just have to educate women and uh, make sure everybody has a higher standard of living. And magic happens. People stop breeding. So the economists have been saying we must get the standard of living up. GDP growth uh, is the most important thing uh, for making this a just, stable, livable world. Hasn't happened. We've wound up in this civilization trap that we can't uh, back out of. Basically, we're exceeding the carrying capacity of this planet trying to get people uh, to a standard of living where they'll stop breeding. So the economist's wet dream cannot work. They're trying to run this race that has made us overshoot as a species. So uh, if we overshoot, we're going to collapse. So most animals have checks and balances that protect them from a bad overshoot. So if there are no wolves in Yosemite, then you know, the deer um, start to degrade all the foliage um, and the environment uh, by overeating it um, and then that foraging uh, reduces their numbers until you get into something resemble a stable oscillation or something that's not catastrophic. Now imagine the deer overshoot. If they overshoot they can wipe out uh, what <coughs> whatever the their source of, uh, of sustenance is and all of their numbers. So they can go co-extinct with whatever um, animals they, they need to, anim plants and animals they need to, to survive. Why? Because of overshoot. And so what the economists have done has made us overshoot on a grand scale. So it means that our population will balloon to about 10 billion and then it will collapse to maybe nothing. We'll go extinct. So the reason for that is this overshoot. And the overshoot has come because of trying to get more and more efficient. So you don't want a carbon tax. Carbon tax will make things more efficient. It'll help Kronos. Why is that bad? It's because 
of the Jevons paradox. The more efficient you make things, the more you'll increase demand. So if you put a carbon tax on, the politicians will say, yes, look, the, the carbon tax is working. Uh, we are starting to reduce our CO2 emissions. Hurrah. But they won't account for is the fact that land use will be atrocious. The environment will be decaying in another way. So you can't get there from here. The economist's wet dream is trying to get Kronos to outrun Kairos. And you can't do that. You can't outrun the fates and risk by uh, rigidity. So totalitarianism, conformity, rigidity cannot defeat the fates uh, and Kairos. The, cannot defeat the wind, cannot defeat uh, the randomness of nature. And that's what the project, the whole civilization project has been hell bent on, is uh, to try and worship this horrid tyrant in the sky, which you call God, and go to church and pray to. And he's Kronos. He's the god of the clock. And he's the god of the clock. All, the ultimate thing he's counting down is your life, but he's keeping that treadmill going for him. Now at this stage you might be going, whoa, dude, that is fucking nuts. You take time component out of all contracts, it's like, hey, wait, 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 how will that even function? Okay, now I'm going to have to leave it to you to work out the ramifications of this, but they're very broad and they're very deep and I just simply don't have the time, the bandwidth, like Kronos, to... Uh, to explain it to you all in great detail. So I leave as a homework exercise a rather fascinating exploration of the implications of what I'm just saying. But what I think you'll see is this whole world opening up as you explore what the uh, fallout would be from this change. So let's just go through a few and I'll tell you, tell you a few. Okay, now an economist would say, this is crazy. You, you, can't, you can't take time out of a contract. I mean, somebody from commercial law said that, that, that the, whole, the whole of civilization would fall apart. So, yes, that's the whole point. <laughs> that, that's the whole point is we need to de-industrialize. And we need to do it in terms of uh, going from fast food to the French's slow food. To, uh, there's more abundance in slow food than there is in fast food. So you are chasing diminishing returns with fast food. McDonald's gets shitter and shitter as you go. Uh, the whole food movement gets better and better as you go. And it's liable to support more people in the end than basically a, a steady stream of entropy, which is another word of saying shit. So hamburgers turn more and more to shit as they perfect the system. You get less and less sesame seeds. You get something moving further and further away from a cow as the meat in the patty. And there's, that's a sliding scale that will go on forever till people are eating just pure shit. And that's, uh, I'm sorry to use that word, but it, it, I know it offends alien cortexes. Uh, but that shit is the alien cortex's word for entropy. So uh, what McDonald's is doing is the pursuit of entropy. Now, let's just start to examine what it means to take time out of all contracts okay so let's take something is like okay well how would it work how would you rent a car you do it by the mile you parade it okay so then what about things like um employment you couldn't do an employment contract because you couldn't pay somebody a salary how do you write an employment contract that says i pay you by the month they say you couldn't pay anybody by the month you'd have to have it either pay people piecemeal okay say for example you're a restaurateur you'd say well i can't have any staff then no you can have staff you can pay them by say the tables they serve you can say pay them by a proportion of the takings all of these are legitimate and fair way of compensating staff what's not fair is to pay people by the hour have them racing around the tables and then you keep all the profits so that's the unfair thing out of capitalism. If, if the law was changed so that you couldn't do that, uh, you were prevented by the fact that any agreement like that would be automatically nullifying. That would force a more um, uh, fair employee-employer um, employer relationship because people would be paid based on their product automatically. You'd have to because you couldn't pay them 
by a ton. And then you might say, well, that, that's ridiculous. You know, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I, I'm running a business. I can't pay people by the, the, the widget, okay? Some people have intellectual knowledge. They're valuable people that's, you know, the company needs, they're part of the brain trust of my company. I need them uh, to be part of the company. I need to bind them to the company. That's fine. They're shareholders. So you respect that by giving them shares. So there is an implication based on that, that there are a couple of follow on laws. First law that you just have no component of time is allowed in contracts is a very simple bit of legislation to put through. If you assume that, well, then people still need some kind of employee employer relationship, which I don't think should exist. But anyway, let's say that uh, capitalists and the where we've got to, we cannot really, it's too big a leap to, to, to move away from that. So fine. We say that, you know, there's an employee employer relationship. Uh, but then if they cannot be paid by some piecemeal way, then they really are part of the enterprise and it needs to be reckoned. So you need to then cha change uh, securities law because otherwise it's just too easy to cheat on the first one. So for example, uh, you can just give people stock options. Uh, by the way, if you have a look at a contract, if you ban, a co say, chronological time from contracts, uh, you could still keep Kairos in there. So you can say when. So for example, you could say, for example, um, like life insurance. You could say when or if you die, that's a Kairos time, right? No one can say chronologically when that's going to happen. So it's quite acceptable to have insurance that would say when or you die, you get this payout. Wouldn't be possible to say, but we collect premiums on a monthly basis. No, you couldn't do that. That would invalidate the insurance. So you would have to say something like, put up this lump sum, and then when you die, we'll pay out this. Or we'll pay out n times the lump sum. All of that would be fair. But it's not fair to say, you've got a premium. If you fall behind on the premiums, you're no longer covered. That's unfair. That's Kronos. So Kronos cannot be substituted on top of Kairos. So you can have an event specified in a contract as long as it's not predictable. Predictable. You can't say in advance when it's going to happen. That's our alien cortex. That's Kronos. And that's... Uh, so you can say uh, something like <clears throat> on your... Um, 18th birthday, blah, blah, blah. No, that's Kronos. But you can say, in the event that you lose an arm, no one knows when that is, so you're still safe according to the law. Okay, so I think, think you basically get that. But the reason why you need now to change securities law is you need to make some basic changes because otherwise they will reestablish the employer-employer relationship as a master-slave relationship uh, by ha using just different classes of stock, uh, stock options, things like that. So uh, there would have to be, if you keep the employer-employee relationship, you have to say that there can only be one class of stock. See, the way it works now in our debt-based system, what you call capitalism, but it's debtism, is the capitalist, the person that extends the debt, the venture capitalist, uh, that's the venture debtist, uh, what they do is they have different classes of stock. So it makes sure that they have unequal protection in terms of risk. They have preferred stock, and that's what uh, an investor gets. Why? Because it's the same old trick as an employer does. It tries to shove the risk on the lower classes of stock. So the ordinary stock carries the risk. Uh, the preferential stock is the guys that put the money in there. And, he, you know, it's the golden rule again. Whoever has the gold makes the rules. And those, are, of course, the rules are to force Kairos onto you and to keep Kronos uh, in the hands of the parasite, which is the people we love so much, the capitalists or the debtists, what we should be calling them. So if you say there can only be one class of stock, and the only way you can take money out of a corporation is with dividends, uh, then you have a fair system. So that breaks the master-slave relationship in terms of employer and employee. So 
you can't have any preferential stock. So you can borrow money, you can give stock for it, but that stock would, would take distributions only by dividends, and they would have to be equal dividends because there'd be just one class of stock. So that's a very important bit of uh, securities law that would have to change so that you could make equity equitable. Equity is not equitable as we stand in the capitalist world. It needs to be made equitable. Otherwise, people will just use uh, share ownership to, to bind people in a new way. Uh, so it's not entirely obvious based on what I just said why it, it would be fair and why you need one class of stock, but you need to think it through a bit perhaps and you'll, you'll get what it means. So you cannot have, uh, in essence, you cannot have, say, the executive paid one way, uh, the CEO paid another way. Uh, you cannot have the investors um, paid back another way. And then you have employees that are paid back with a salary. All distributions would have to be dividends, and that implies that they'd all have to be relative to the stockholder. Now, if you're an employer, you could say, well, hang on a minute. What keeps the guy coming in, working nine to five every day like I need him to, um, if I give him stock, could walk away? But yes. <laughs> That's where we need to get to. You can't make somebody come in nine to five if they have stock. And you have to give them enough stock to make them interested in your enterprise. Otherwise, they shouldn't be there. And that would make it fair. So yes, you might give somebody stock, but you can't do it on conditions. You, can only, you can't use stock options. They would have to be banned. So anything, any th exotic instruments, that let you have um, proportional ownership or equity in a, in a corporation would have to be banned out, outright. So yes, if you gave shares to somebody, they might trick you. They might just walk away. You would either have to buy those shares back or you would have to give you know, dividends till the end of time. Say, so, yep, that's what it means to be a capitalist. That's what it should mean to be an entrepreneur uh, in a, a fair world um, and yeah CEO, uh, CEOs used to be paid like 12, 12 times what the lowest employer, employee was paid and then now they're paid like uh, getting close to 400 times the lowest em employee in America <laughs> their salary well they would have to have that proportion of stock and every time you gave a bonus to a CEO you'd be diluting the stock of the workers and they would protest and they have a very strong form of protest they can walk away keep their shares and you still have to pay them so a strike is automatically built into the fact that you you have shares so they are really truly joint um, associates in an enterprise and not these fake lies that uh, all the corporations in America do they call you an associate and a valued employee and it's a, you're not a partner you're not a part of their enterprise they're just exploiting you so you'd say either you're a part or you're paid by your work product that would be your only two options uh, based on these two laws removing the time component from all contracts and then making sure there's only one class of stock and there's other derivative instruments would have to be banned. And they probably would be banned by the first thing that you can't have uh, Kronos in a, in a contract. There is one more law uh, that would need to be changed. And then that would be that you, you would have to ban uh, coercion for profit. So in other words, you couldn't have entirely free speech. Uh, just It's not a, um, an infringement on the First Amendment. Uh, you just cannot have you, you would have to ban people trying to persuade somebody for money. That practice would have to be banned. And the reason for it is, is quite subtle, but uh, the other two, the two uh, preceding uh, changes to the law would be undermined if people could uh, really um, influence somebody for money. So what that means is, the, the, you, you're just not allowed to, essentially it's exactly the same laws you have against con men. Uh, First Amendment rights don't protect you as a con man. If I tell you something and try and persuade you something, I try to build your confidence so that I can make money out of you, take you for a sucker, uh, that's banned. And so this would be the same thing. You, you couldn't do advertising 
if you made money from it. So advertising would, would disappear as well. Uh, Madison Avenue would have to close down. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can't persuade somebody of something. You just can't do it for profit. So if I want to persuade you, say, of climate change, and I'm a scientist, perhaps, then I can write books galore. I can write, I can get paid for those books just so much as it uh, covers the costs of the book. I can't make uh, books, or, or basically gives you entertainment value is quite valid too, uh, but where you'd be vulnerable is if you wrote a book saying oil or say nuclear power is uh, really valuable in our future and then you know you were Mr. Burns and you had a nuclear power station, a clear conflict of interest and then that kind of behavior would be banned. So uh, you couldn't advertise a pro pro uh, product, you couldn't say you know the, you know, BMW is a fantastic car and you do all you build this big ethos out of it and put these ads out and you say you could only do that if you made no profit out of uh, BMW otherwise it's conflict of interest so those are the three pillars but in essence I would say that the first demand should be the only demand that that XR has is just to uh, extinction rebellion all these kind of uh, movements um, that are trying to foment change and trying to get us out of the super wicked predicament um, I would strongly recommend that you just have this one single one and say that politicians make an amendment to the law to say that any existing contract that has a time component chronological time linear time date calendar date is invalidated automatically and then any new contracts uh, you know couldn't be written uh, because they would be nullified automatically um, unless they fulfilled that criteria so you might be thinking now okay let's look at a few more examples of what would happen say so what what about the bond market well it's in the name <laughs> bond no bonds this is a free society I'm talking about so bonds are would automatically be invalidated so if you held bonds uh, basically they have a coupon and you get paid a premium um, that would no longer be enforceable so all financial instruments uh, most of them um, in insurance could be done like I mentioned uh, but it really would be a clean sweep in, ter in, in essence it would be a debt jubilee so think of a bank banks couldn't take deposits because they couldn't promise you interest on a regular schedule. Uh, you could only do it in terms of an event. So, you know, you deposit a, some amount with the bank, and then the bank could promise you that when you withdraw it, they would pay double. What they couldn't say is, ah, oh, we'll pay you, um, you know, 10% for each month you had in it. The fact they mentioned a month would invalidate that agreement. So banking, in effect, uh, deposit banking would cease to, to exist. The, the same in, in, in terms of debt. So, um, yeah, you could give somebody some money. You could say, well, when you pay it back, I will give you an extra 20%. Or you could say, I'll loan you this certain amount. But uh, at some stage, and you couldn't specify when, you have to give me 10% back. If the person didn't decide to pay you back ever, that, that would be your tough luck. You could say that I give you this <coughs> money now on the event of your death, uh, it would be repaid double. So it would be possible to do urgery, uh, something like that, but you, you couldn't force somebody uh, based on the clock to have a repayment schedule. So uh, in essence, that's the end of the, the debtist system and a return to, to fairness. Okay, now you must be, might be wondering, well, what happens to, say, renters? How can you be a landlord? Well, you can't. You shouldn't be a landlord. That's a kind of parasitic behavior that just means because you can afford a piece of property, you can section off that property, uh, claim it as your own, and claim rent from people. So there's nothing to stop somebody, so renting from you, but it would be very difficult to collect rent. So even a hotel would have to say, Something like, you know, they couldn't say we charge by the night. They would have to say, you know, it's this amount of money for a rest. 
that's as much as you could do. You couldn't charge by the day. So everything would be have to be pro prorated based on usage. Um, and renting would would be problematic. So the rental the amount of rental properties out there and the number of people that have been bought into this parasitic behavior uh, would would crash. The property prices would crash because a lot of the value of property is the fact that they can be used as rentals. Um, so there are a lot of things implied in all of this. In Britain, boy, out here in Greece, all these yachts, uh, a lot of these yachts are because people bought properties back with Maggie Thatcher when Maggie, Maggie Thatcher uh, did the financialization, liberalized the law so you had the right to buy. So a lot of English people are out here on yachts and what they're doing is they're living off young people. So they're renting places in Britain so they can be out here on a yacht. Um, that is not right. But it implies that if you made this change, they would lose their income. So you almost forced into a lot of these follow on uh, repercussions, like, for example, making a UBI. So you would have to have some kind of UPI, UBI or compensation uh, to, to people that no, no longer had a rental income, particularly the older and wealthy people. The society would be automatically be much fairer, but the standard of living of a lot of people would reduce. It would become far more equitable. Overall, consumption would decrease. And that's what would happen on a broad scale. So now... Uh, economists would immediately go, this guy is absolutely crazy. This would cause a recession. So, yes, we need a recession. We need deindustrialization. We need less efficiency. We need to scale back. Now, a lot of people just, this is such thought crime of such monstrous and huge proportions. We've been so inculcated with this passion for growth, this, uh, this religion of the economy, this infinite growth paradigm which is set to make us go extinct, that, but right in the face of it, people cannot believe, uh, especially economists, can't believe that you would have such hideous thought crime that you could actually say, uh, you are asking for a recession? Yes, yes, we need a recession on a grand scale, we need a depression, we need to de-industrialize. It's the only way to stop us going extinct. Now, this is amazing to particularly economists. It's so heterodox that even when I proposed a debt strike, uh, I got a lot of comments saying, you're crazy, you don't understand economics. This would actually damage the economy. I said, yes, you moron. That's supposed to damage the economy. We have to more than damage the economy. We have to slaughter it like a sacred cow. The sacred cow needs to be chopped up, minced meat, made absolutely cube size. So this is the way to get there painlessly and fairly. It's, it's one demand that you take Kronos out of contracts. And almost naturally the fallout from all of this, uh, they're hidden inside that this one demand is a debt jubilee, a UBI. All of these things are implied by the, the fallout and the ramifications as this, um, you know, the repercussions of this move uh, would filter down. But if you, if you demanded this and never got it, at the very least, you get people thinking about the, the capitalist system, thinking of it more as a debt system, uh, getting wage slaves to question their slavery. All of this would be secondary wins even if you don't get the primary demand. You might get a psychological win, and that could have enough repercussions. So I say to people like XR, get rid of your stupid three demands. They're ridiculous. I mean, they're, they're embarrassing. Stop that shit. You just need one demand. Get Kronos out of contracts. So no time component in any binding agreement. Any contract or agreement would be automatically nullified if it specified linear time, calendar date. That's it.